Good morning, good day, good afternoon. It's Mr. Lewandowski, and uh, I checked through my analytics on this video series. One person, one person is cruising through it at this point. If you are that person, let me know you're alive. Drop, drop a like, give me a comment. Uh, I really think this is great. I'm gonna try to switch things up a little bit today as I work through the next several paragraphs. This is part five. The other four parts, uh, you can find them in the playlist, you can find them other places. Uh, the idea being that this is the most interesting way to learn vocabulary. Uh, you can also, in the description, you can find a copy of this as a PDF and you can download that. So you can do these annotations as I do them. And then the idea is you can reread it and you'll see those words in context. And this is how you, this is how you learn vocabulary. I'm gonna try a different technique today. I'm gonna uh, read every paragraph through in full, and then I'm gonna define the words. Uh, I'm gonna highlight all potential vocabulary words in blue. Several of Paul's teachers, how's Paul doing? Paul's having some serious problems. We're gonna, what's going on with Paul? Several of Paul's teachers had a theory that his imagination had been perverted by garish, fiction. But the truth was, he scarcely ever read at all. The books at home were not such as would either tempt or corrupt a youthful mind, but as for reading the novels that some of his friends urged upon him, well, he got what he wanted much more quickly from music, any sort of music, from an orchestra to a barrel organ. He needed only the spark, the indescribable thrill that made his imagination master of his senses, and he could make plots and pictures enough of his own. It was equally true that he was not stage-struck, not at any rate in the usual acceptation of the expression, he had no desire to become an actor any more than he had to become a musician. He felt no necessary, he felt no necessity to do any of these things. What he wanted to see, what he want, <laughs> what he wanted was to see, to be in the atmosphere, float on the wave of it, to be carried out, Blue league after blue league away from everything. Perverted, uh, just in this case, means changed in a bad way. Changed, but bad. Garish. Garish is uh, kind of like over the top. Um, graphic. And distasteful. Garish. He scarcely ever read it all. Scarcely is like barely, hardly which means like very little. Something that's scarce is just not available. It's not there. There's not very much of it. His friend urged upon him, tried to get him. So that's, that's, that's the kind of thing you learn from uh, reading, is how verbs can be used in different ways his friends urged upon them. We think of an urge as something like, you know, something you have to do, but an urge can be put to you where you're urged to do something. Indescribable, this is the kind of word where people might be like, oh, it's long, I don't know, but it's just in, meaning uh, not describable. Can't describe it. Stage struck. Have you ever heard the expression star struck? 
stage struck is kind of like star struck like um like he 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 didn't want to become famous he didn't want to become a famous actor i got that as well from the context acceptation you hardly ever use this but like it has to do with accept like the accepted Blue League after Blue League. I'm thinking that this is a reference to a league is uh, is distance. League is distance. That's like more than a mile, I think. Distance. Why Blue League? Blue League. Uh, sometimes things that are off in the distance kind of turn to like a blue color. But it could also mean uh, ocean. After a night behind the scenes, Paul found the schoolroom more than ever repulsive. The bare floors and naked walls, the prosy men who never wore frock coats or violets in their buttonholes, the women with their dull gowns, shrill voices, pitiful seriousness about prepositions that govern the dative. He could not bear to have the other pupils think for a moment that he took these people seriously. He must convey to them that he considered it all trivial and was there only by way of a joke anyway. He had autographed pictures of all the members of the stock company which he showed his classmates, telling them the most incredible stories of his familiarity with these people of his acquaintance with the soloists who came to Carnegie Hall, his suppers with them, and the flowers he sent them. When these stories lost their effect and his audience grew listless, he would bid all the boys goodbye, announcing that he was going to travel for a while, going to Naples, to California, to Egypt. Then, next Monday, he would slip back, conscious and nervously smiling. His sister was ill, and he would have to defer his voyage until spring. Oh, Paul. Prosy. You don't usually see pros prosy like this, but what it means is it has to do with prose, which is writing in paragraphs. Repulsive, great word, repulsive, love it. Basically means gross, yuck. School is repulsive says Paul. Frock coats. These are long coats. A long coat. This is a specific kind of coat. Shrill is like piercing, like high-pitched piercing. P-I-E-R-C-I-N-G. High-pitched piercing, shrill voices. Prepositions? Oh, the prepositions. I'm going to give you some prepositions because I actually am an English teacher. I'm not going to not going to not give you some prepositions in on <laughs> over under through class. These are prepositions. You can use prepositions to make prepositional phrases. Prepositional phrases are some of the most important small work. They're like the little they're like the little uh, little, little screws and nails that hold language together. The dative is, <laughs> it's a case. So it's like the past, the present, the something, the dative. It's a grammar. Grammar case. Which means, has to do with, don't worry about it. Um, convey, this is a good word that you should know. So, like, there's tons of words in here. Some of them are better and more useful than others. Convey. Think of a conveyor belt. I'm going to draw a little conveyor belt. Do, 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 this is a conveyor belt. Does it look like a conveyor belt? And it's going in a direction. It's going in that direction. So that's what convey does. Convey brings you things. Um, he must convey to them. He must bring to them. A lot of times you talk about emotions being conveyed. Conveying emotions is one of the most important things that writing does. He considered it all trivial. Think about trivia. It's 
trivia, like it's important. You want to, you know, you want to answer the question right. But what's it for? It's not that important, really. Trivia. It's just things that don't really matter. Um, so trivia means you know, it doesn't matter. It might be a fact, but it doesn't really matter. So it's a trivia contest. You're just having a contest to see who knows more facts or whatever. Uh, listless. This is something every teacher knows is when your class grows listless. It's kind of like bored and fidgety. Not my class ever, but some classes. Uh, he would bid. Bid is, in this case, like bid you adieu. I bid you adieu is an old fashioned way to say like farewell, goodbye, adios. Bid is to give something. I would give all the boys goodbye, bid. So it's kind of like give, kind of like say. I bid you good night, announcing that he was going to travel for a while, going to Naples, California. Oh, sorry. Conscious. Here, conscious means like aware. What's he aware of in this moment? He lied, and it's obvious that he lied, so he's going to make up another lie. Have to defer, postpone. Let me know if you like this way better. That'd be great. I can do tons of these. I, I kind of love them. Matters were steadily worse with Paul at school. In the itch to let his instructors know how heartily he despised them and how thoroughly he was appreciated elsewhere, he mentioned once or twice that he had no time to fool with theorems, adding with a twitch of the eyebrows and a touch of that nervous bravado which so perplexed them that he was helping the people down at the stock company. They were old friends of his. How heartily, sounds like completely, completely, like from the heart. Theorems, this is like math, math proofs. Or science theories, math proofs theories, theoretical. I'm not like Paul. I like the th I like the theater and stuff like that, but I also like theory and theorems. So his nervous oh bravado, bravado. I bet you don't know. Uh, nervous bravado, especially, is like false, false courage. Like, it's like courage and like bravado is, you know, to be brave. Um, but it's like you're putting that on. Like, it's not, it's not real. Perplexed. Confused. It's a puzzle you can't figure out. He was a puzzle. His teachers couldn't figure out. And they, I, I think they wanted to help him. The upshot of the matter was... That the principal went to Paul's father, and Paul was taken out of school and put to work. The manager at Carnegie Hall was told to get another usher in his stead. The doorkeeper at the theater was warned not to admit him to the house, and Charlie Edwards remorsefully promised the boy's father not to see him again. The upshot here, it's kind of like the result. And this paragraph is pretty important here. It's the kind of thing if you were just reading this, you might be like, you might go, you might, you might pass over it without stopping and really thinking about what this means for Paul. For Paul, this means that his life is over. <laughs> He's taken out of school and put to work. Well, what's, what's his work going to be? It's not going to be at Carnegie Hall. It's not going to be playing at the theater where he, you know, or his life is. The members of the stock company were vastly amused when some of Paul's stories reached them, especially the women. They were hardworking women, most of them supporting indolent husbands or brothers, and they laughed rather bitterly at having stirred the boy to such fervid and florid inventions.
they agreed with the faculty and with his father that Paul's was a bad case. Let's see, that might be the end of the paragraph. Yes. Perfect. We're vastly amused. Vast, well, usually it refers to space. It's like a very large space, but it's, anyway, it's something that's vast is large. I'll just put it that way. Indolent. Well, how does indolent sound? Does it sound good? It's not. You don't want to be indolent. Um, indolent is like uh, incapable. Um, I don't know. Almost also like incapable, incompetent, mean. You don't want to be indolent. It's a very bad thing to be. Fervid and florid are kind of like a pair. They're perfect. They're a perfect pair. They both they both have connotations of like fevered, feverish, fervid. So fervid is like strong. Florid is like expressive. But they both have like a negative connotations here because they're inventions, they're lies. And they both fervid sounds well, I don't want to get into it too much, but that's basically how those words work. One more paragraph. One more paragraph. The eastbound train was plowing through a January snowstorm. The dull dawn was beginning to show gray when the engine whistled a mile out of Newark. Paul started up from the seat where he had lain curled in uneasy slumber, rubbed the breath-misted window glass with his hand, and peered out. Snow was whirling in curling eddies above the white bottomlands, and the drifts lay already deep in the fields along the fences, while here and there the long-dead grass and dried weed stalks protruded black above it. Lights shone from the scattered houses and a gang of laborers who stood beside the track waved their lanterns. Peered. Looked. Eddies. Swirls. Protruded. Sticks out. Gang, just a group here. There's no connotation of like, you know, bad people doing bad things. Awesome. Yeah, one or two pages left. Stay tuned for volume six.